Hello and welcome to Better Under Pressure. I'm Sarah Milne author of The Shed Method and founder of Coaching Impact. And in this podcast, I talk to leaders from all walks of life about being better under pressure and using pressure for better. I want to explore how we handle pressure in a world that is becoming more and more complex, the impact that that pressure has on our ability to perform at our best and what we do to be better under pressure. Thoughts, recurring thoughts that you only ever get at like two or three in the morning is very irritating. Mm -hmm. How do you take them out of your mind because sleep is so important Mm -hmm. and you just can't go back in the next day if you haven't had enough sleep? And, and and be able to you know perform well and 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 help everybody today i'm talking to rachel osborne ceo of ted baker she was appointed to that role just as covid hit the uk prior to that she'd been cfo at debenhams retail limited having originally studied veterinary medicine at cambridge rachel chose instead to qualify as a chartered accountant at kpmg She now has over 30 years of financial experience with consumer-facing brands like Domino's Pizza, Vodafone and John Lewis. She's also previously held senior positions with Sodexo, Kingfisher and PepsiCo. In this conversation, Rachel shares what she's learned from leading businesses in distress, the advantages of a board that's positively challenging and why she's become grateful for ships in the night. Rachel, thank you so much for joining me on Better Under Pressure. Thank you, Sarah. I'm delighted, I think, to be here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good, good word of caution there. I wondered if we should start with, do you remember the first time you experienced pressure or had a feeling that you labelled as pressure? Do you, do you remember that? Yeah, I do, actually. I um. I think the earliest time I did a lot of sport when I was younger. Mm-hmm. I think it's the it's the feeling that you get. I think the one that sticks with me is just before you're going to run that hundred meters race. And I would have been eleven, maybe. Now before that, I did ballet exams, I so you. I I would have felt pressure going into them, but it doesn't. It hasn't stuck with me in the same way as the adrenaline of because you really are having to sort of flight in in uh, in in that moment in sport. Um, so that's that's the one that I remember as the the first time I felt that pressure. Yes. And do you um, as you think back on it now, do you did you associate it with something that was actually going to push you to do really well? I mean, was it a, how would you describe the feeling? I mean, would you see did you see it as a, a positive force? on that start yes I, I think I think you are you're excited to to compete and to run your race um so yes I, I you know I still to this day associate the smell of cut grass with sports day yeah and I, I love it and therefore it must be overall positive with moments of terror <laughs> yes yeah yeah marvelous and so as you've gone through has pressure always remained a positive association to performing well for you? Um, I think there's there's two parts to that question almost, even though they went together. Um, I don't always enjoy pressure, having experienced Mm. it most recently in business. Mm -hmm. um, But does it lead to some level of of improvement in performance? For sure. Just because physiologically... Uh, as long as it's not prolonged and endless and you feel like you're trapped and yeah. can't get away from it, I think for, you know, in healthy bursts, then yes, I do associate it with better performance and and, and therefore, uh, I guess, a better outcome. Brilliant. I mean, maybe you could share some experiences, um, Rachel. I love the fact that you've dove straight into yeah. your association with business and that you don't normally, or, well, you don't always enjoy it. Um, mm. Can you give us some examples when you've experienced pressure in business or in your any of your leadership roles that you've had and you've turned it into not feeling great about it into something that has actually catapulted you into something that is better um yes i think so i i you know when i um joined debenhams i had not been 
made aware of quite how tricky things were. And you never are until you're in somewhere, right? When you're going through an interview process and all the rest of it. Um, And it was something that I hadn't, I'd never experienced a distressed business before, probably been quite lucky at that uh, up until that point. Um, And then really being in that CFO role. So you're actually in charge of more so than probably a chief exec in some instances of distress, because a lot of it is around the financials. Yeah. Um, and I'm just thinking, right, well, I'd, I've not done this before, but I'm leading this, so I've got to get it. I got this. So I remember just thinking, right, I need to be decisive. I can't be dithering around. You know, I will listen to experts and make sure that the advisors are talking to me, but I won't listen to any one person. Um, and, you know, th- the decisions need to be made quickly. And so that helped me just, just you know, face into it and say right okay no dithering get on with it these things need to be done they need to be done fast I know where we're heading towards I know where the deadline of it not being great is so it all needs to get done quickly and that I, was love positive. That, I love that <laughs> I love that sort of dialogue that you say to yourself right I have to be de- decisive and and therefore there's no dithering and then and is that um, um a sort of self-talk that comes to you quite often in those sorts of moments Rachel um I think so. I'm. I think because, as someone who I think about things, I'm not a reflector. I have learnt that actually, giving myself pause and time to reflect is a very positive thing okay. to do. But that is not my need to right. come to a decision. I'm. I'm very quick to uh, assimilate information. Don't need to go away to digest it. I don't think. Uh, to come to a view. So I think my natural preference probably helps me do that when you have to be decisive. It's how I think. Yeah. Okay. So, so the push for you or the, or the, um, the new habit for you that you've had to learn is to realize when that actually that natural instinct to push through and be decisive and go fast is maybe not the most useful way forward. Yes, exactly. Especially when you're trying to take people with you. Yes. Um, you know, in in some forms of sort of distressed organisations, then it is a bit you find your leadership drifting into the command and control, which is not the natural preference when something's a bit more calm. Mm. And so you do have to think, how do I make sure that this, I am not just pulling those levers that actually I'm helping build a sense of shared purpose and commitment towards something so that other people can take on that pressure to perform as well it can't just sit on 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 your shoulders and if you don't engage people in the journey of what you're trying to do and the goal that we're trying to get to then you end up shouldering an awful lot more of that pressure yourself yeah and so going I love this word about distressed business I haven't heard that very often actually so (laughs) good it's a good thing (laughs) Uh, yeah, uh, but it seems familiar to you, Rachel. Somehow. It does, sadly, yes. <laughs> um, so when you went into Debenhams, for example, how do, how do you go into a distressed business with a de- decisive mindset and you're, you're responsible for the financials? Mm. How do you take, just talk me through about how do you recognise where people are in that distressed business and how do you take those people forward in those sorts of pressure moments actually this feels like quite a prolonged pressure moment if you're in a distressed business it's not mm. necessarily for a short amount of time is it yeah it, it it's it is usually not for a short amount of time and yeah. um a lot of the the factors that get a business into that situation aren't always in a short term under control under the control of the business so there are elements of what you know control what you can Yes. And try and manage the things and anticipate the things that you can't and how you might be agile around those. So I think, you know, the first thing you have to do is is you have to get everyone on the same page of understanding of the situation. So, you know, the, the Hackney term burning platform is, uh, is, is helpful because mm. if people think there is more time or people actually are in denial mm-hmm. of there is an issue, then you're not going to be able to move organizations and, um, I think, you know, in experiences that I've had, especially at Debenhams, the, you know, the people that weren't up for it naturally over time stepped away mm-hmm. and you ended up with what we call the kind of the warriors that 
Mm. are actually let's just do this so you can't persuade everybody in a in a difficult environment that that's for them yeah because you can't you can't pretend to people that it's going to be better than it is that you know but there is there is a purpose there is a goal we're heading towards it there are always things out of one's control that means you may not achieve it but you do everything in your own capability to make sure that doesn't happen I think you just have to have that shared sense of where we're going yeah um yeah. And, and, you know, in, 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 and you can see there are certain people that thrive in that and other people that, that really would rather not be in that environment and, you know, and, and then self-select over time. Yeah. Do you thrive in that? Um, I think it's a difficult one because thriving does imply really deeply benefiting and, and valuing and, enjoying it and I, I I couldn't sort of pretend that that that's <laughs> that, that being in that circumstance is something that I would have um relished doing on the on a long-term basis I think I felt to be honest with you more sense of responsibility to fix it rather than thriving yeah. in it there was a sense yeah. that people are looking to me I have to do this this is the role that that naturally now has fallen to me to do so a sense of responsibility probably more than, more than thriving. Yes. Now when I look back on it, wow, I'm really proud of what we all achieved. Hmm. But in in the moment, not not thrive is a difficult word to associate with the distressed business, I think. Yes. Businesses yes. that are growing, I could see, but there's still challenges and pitfalls. You could say, yes, you could thrive in that because the outcome is so much better than if you'd not been there and and distressed businesses don't get me wrong it's also you know the business is there right and it would not have been there if you hadn't been there and therefore you've saved jobs you've moved things forward yeah um but I think I would rather thrive in in happier circumstances yes yeah yes I completely understand that so, so when you what keeps you s- sort of strong enough to take th- take you and those other people that you're leading Rachel, through those sorts of situations? Well, I think when you're in a leadership role, you 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 take a lot of responsibility for making sure that the outcome happens. Um, I think you just as you as you become more senior in an organization, you have to recognize it doesn't it isn't just there's there's more to do and there's more money, right? There is more mm. responsibility for other people's livelihoods than yeah, your immediate family. and that's always family. mattered to you, hasn't it, actually? That, yes. um, my, my sense of you is that, that that responsibility for other people matters to you immensely. It's like mm. a strong value of yours. But if you think about you, right, like I'm thinking there's there are a lot of people at the moment who are dealing with businesses that are distressed Yes. right now, I would yeah. say. Yeah. And, and if they were listening to this and they're in the heart of it, you know, they're in the eye of the storm, mm. what, what would you say, what would you offer... I mean, I know we're going to come to this later on in the conversation, but just let's take in Debenhams. What helped you do that? What were the things that really helped you? You know, manage yourself, lead others, stay sort of focused on driving forward. What What would you say are the things that really helped you? Were there people? Were there things you did? Were there what What was in your life at that time that yeah. made a difference? I, I think um, having people around that were committed to doing that really helped because you know that you can rely on others and, and, and help drive things forward. We had really good advisors um, and the team around me were, you know, I had, a, I had a really good finance team. Um, and, and so having that, that, that team mm. that's up for it really helped me. I think if you're by yourself, that, that is, that it, it's a lonely place yeah and, and don't get me wrong it's still lonely in a leadership position um but it you know and having people who I mean you know my my board at the time were very experienced and, right. and extremely supportive they weren't shouldering the work because in a non-exec role you don't do that you you advise and support and challenge but that support yes um uh makes you believe in yourself more right so having yes. that having people who believe in you whether you know whether you can do it or not you, yourself you yeah. you know other people are kind of supporting and and helping you that's really important 
Oh gosh, I love this. Can we can we hover over this for a minute? Because I think what you're raising here is something very interesting around how do you get the support of your non-exec or your board, or you, you know how how did you feel that support, Rachel? Um, yeah, they were encouraging. Um, they were collegiate. They when when you know we needed to do twice weekly board calls. They were there. They were present. They'd come in mm. physically. You know, it might feel slightly different in a world post-pandemic, actually, where where people's go-to pre-pandemic was if you needed a meeting, you go to it. Yeah. And 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 now that's different. But certainly, that 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 presence of people in a room with you, going mm. through things, and and helping make sure that you haven't missed anything. There's no blind spots. We've got all areas covered. Um, yeah. Was in- incredibly helpful. Um, and you know, and the same in 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 Ted Baker, there have been moments when there were real crises, and yeah. being a PLC, those crises get played out in public and have to be as part yeah. of the rules of being a PLC. Um, and yeah. certainly, you know, that support of the board was was incredible. You know, and but uh, by support, you don't want them to just nod at everything you say, right? You want to no. have the challenge as well, because supporting isn't just saying yes. Supporting is making sure that the outcome. And you are better as a result of their help. Yeah. And that's a really fine line, isn't it, between what you're talking about, that sort of positive encouragement, but sort of positive challenge, actually, mm. in, in a situation that's clearly very worrying. Um, mm. But at the same time, not so challenging. I mean, this is back, you know, it's back to that balance between when is pressure really helpful and forces you to, to do better? Um, and when is it actually just too depleting or too yes. overwhelming or yeah. actually then you've got a different issue that you're dealing with which is try, trying to build a relationship where you feel someone has lost faith in you mm. and I love this point that you're making around belief and faith that when you feel like you have the belief of people around you in this sort of crisis situation um, and have faith in you that's yes. hugely galvanizing isn't it it's amazing actually and you sometimes only realize it in hindsight Interesting. In, in the moment, you're you're in the zone, right? And you're all yeah. having to work together. But you know, you asking me these questions is making me reflect back and seeing how positive it was at the time. Even though, again, the appreciation of you know, it, it's like now that we're at a different phase in Ted Baker. When I have met with the people who were the non-execs, it's just yeah. great. There's a friendship there. Yes, but. But we never spent time together as friends. Yes. We spent time together as work colleagues in in difficult circumstances under pressure. Yes. Um, but what comes out of it is a bond of, I don't know, a connection that that was forged through that. But you sort of, you see it only when you're looking back. And then, and actually, I'm probably the recipient of it more now, more consciously now, that we're not in that situation. And it, it, it feels great. Yeah. Yeah, it's that whole thing of we've gone through something together. It's very, it's very bonding, isn't it? Yes, it is. It is. I wonder. Yeah. You know what? You're I mean, other things. Yeah. Go on. Mm. Go ahead. No, I was going to say other things that you, you asked me about. I mean, I think at certain times, you know, we talked about yeah the balance of when actually, either the the pressure and the stress has gone on too long, and yes. it feels like it's endless. Mm. Then then the things that I think are really important are just finding, I think, two things. One, where do you get your natural energy from? And for me, I know that I need to go outside and walk around and, mm. and be with nature sounds a bit like not, not, not how I mean it to be, but just being around the natural world really replenishes me in a way that my husband says you can see it physically have an effect on me so finding what that what is your source of energy because you'll need it especially when it's ongoing and ongoing you've you know it it it, it can tip over and therefore your performance or your or your body or emotional response mm. to the stress is not positive and these two things may overlap but also how do you relax how mm-hmm. do you actually come down from the heightened level that your body and you know the hormones that flow around put you into when you're under pressure you can't that isn't sustainable how do you then you know mindfulness or whatever thing I have you know a sports massage because I hold a lot of tension in my shoulders and my neck 
and those things for me, I think without them, I would not have been able to have moments of re-energizing and getting back up there to a level to be able to to perform as well as I could. Yes. And you're very dedicated about that in terms yep. of connecting with nature and your massage and your things that you you know need to be in your life during yes. these sorts of high pressure. Yes. Long term moments. And actually even beyond those high pressure moments just how good they are you know I was speaking Mm. to you earlier so since we've taken the business from public to private and that immediate pressure of being in the eye of a PLC um, has dissipated slightly obviously we've got a different world and we've got a different set of journeys and, 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 and opportunities with with the new ownership but I've started walking every day to work an hour Mm -hmm. and making myself do it and after a while it becomes a habit but what I was just I was walking through Hyde Park um on last last week and I I could feel the replenishment I thought gosh I am not doing this just at weekends anymore I'm actually getting it every day and that's great I hadn't really appreciated that because I've just been doing it for health and wellness and getting my, you know, pre-pandemic health back. Um, but I realized, of course, that's also not just exercise. It's how I get my energy. And um, and that's making me feel really good and holding on to. And yes, I, I still have my sports massage. Um, I used to have it once a week. I now have it once a fortnight. But I also find with the sports massage, getting rid of the tension, Ruth, who does my massage, is brilliant. We just chat. Yeah. It's it's an hour of my time where I'm lying down. I am not <laughs> yeah. responsible for doing anything for anybody. And then I just chat with Ruth and she, you know, we just chat away about all sorts of things. Um, and so that's also really good because, you know, I, I also get energy from seeing my friends and things like that. And so I've realized I'm 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 actually getting a bit of uh double upside from, yeah. from doing that. Yeah. And and I love this idea of you know, you sort of forcing the pause. You know, by booking a massage and knowing that you've got this massage in, you know, it's forcing you to lie down yes. <laughs> <laughs> and to have a conversation. But and, and the other thing I thought was really interesting about what you just said there is making me think this walk that you said, you know, you were intentionally doing because you were wanting to get fitter and you were wanting to get healthier and it was post pandemic and you're feeling hazy. And now it seems to have gone into a different phase that you re- reflected on, which is actually I'm now getting, I'm now aware of other things that I'm getting from it as well that has become sort of non-negotiable for me. And I love that idea of doing something almost like remedial at first Mm. and then and then you feel the sort of profound impact that actually once you've gone past the surface of just healing or recovering, Mm. it goes much deeper. Yes. And it's making me think about the things that I do. You know, sometimes I do things to fix a problem or to fix the fact that I'm feeling this or um, I'm feeling unfit. So I'm going to do these exercises rather. And actually what you're making me think about Rachel is just the, the investment long-term in something takes it through layers. Mm. Yes. Of meaning to you if you stick with it. And I'm, I really love that. It only comes over time when it, it moves, as you said, it moves from, doing one thing for you to doing several things for you and therefore it just becomes your habit yes pressure tends to turn up in one of two ways there are peak pressure moments that are short matter immensely and come with a high level of uncertainty or volume you know like a board presentation an exam or a challenging conversation and they're usually over quickly or there is pressure over a long duration the pressure that feels endless and relentless This is the pressure that Rachel's describing. To manage yourself and others through this sort of pressure, knowing how to relax, knowing how, as Rachel says, to come down from the heightened level of response that your body is under when you're experiencing that sort of pressure is vital. Her sports massage re-energizes her and releases the tension in her shoulders. And she knows that walking in nature replenishes her and is a massive source of energy. She prioritizes them both despite or rather because of the long-term pressure. And this is the key point, I think. If we're not careful, pressure, particularly long-term pressure, has a brilliant way of persuading us that our energy habits, whether it's walking in nature, a massage, seeing people we love, 
are just a nice to do rather than an essential and necessary part of managing that pressure and performing well. I hear this so often from clients. Oh, my exercise routine has completely gone off track or I'm eating all the wrong things. As if they've lost the choice. What Rachel reminds us of beautifully is that investing in these habits over time builds layers of deeper understanding of what they mean to us. She's not only having a massage and releasing tension, she's also having a chat with Ruth who gives her energy. By Rachel committing to her walks in nature, they've brought her a more profound awareness of the multiple benefits. These properly selfish moments that we commit to bring us multiple benefits over time, moving as Rachel puts it from doing one thing for us to doing several things for us. A choice that began as perhaps remedial can become profound. We have to choose to boss the pressure and invest in the things that give us the energy to be better at managing it. Do you share this with the people that you work? So, I mean, I, I know that you feel like you're slightly out of crisis right now in terms of where you are with Ted Baker, but, but boy, you've been through a few of them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, do you, did you actively, what were some of the things you actively did with your team to help all of you manage the immense, well, the immense uncertainty really and volatility that you've been through over the last year, particularly or more with Ted Baker? Um, we did quite a lot of work together as a team uh, with facilitation and yes. and we agreed it, it allowed us to um, create that joint sense of purpose so that there was a level of co-creation rather than it's just coming from me yeah. um, I think if people feel that they've they're part of the they've cre helped create the answer and therefore they can be part of delivering the answer I think it's much more fulfilling for people so we did quite a lot of that we check in regularly when we first started it we thought this is a bit too much but we have we started doing every day at the beginning of the day we would do a check-in now most of this was like pandemic and from home and all the rest mm -hmm. of it um and now we've slowed it down but actually we still do it three times a week for 15 minutes and we then spend two hours a week together every week on things to discuss more so it has different paces to it so it's it's mm -hmm. not spending time together just for the sake of it I mean we are saying right what's important let's not just waffle what's important what's on and it keeps a sense of everybody what everybody is doing and and helps you move out of your own tiny world back into mm -hmm. the world of your team on a, on a regular basis yeah so that there's just a shared a, a sense of shared awareness um so we've done quite a lot of that and that now just is a rhythm and routine of what we do and how we do it mm -hmm. we obviously we've made there, were, there was a time deep in the pandemic when we were at a phase when we, we, you know, we could have lost the business. We needed to refinance it. We needed to raise equity. Uh, we needed to sell our office and lease it back. So to recapitalize the entire business, you know, and it was it was high pressure because if you didn't, you, mm -hmm. there wasn't a lot of fun after that. Um, and we used to have uh, a Thursday afternoon check in and we'd all wear silly hats and have a drink. Yeah. And we just go sometimes you just got to blow off a bit of steam and allow the 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 humor of the uh, not of the situation because the situation wasn't funny but the humor of having to be a human being in in crisis with a team and sometimes not being able to control it all and therefore you just have to kind of as you said l l find ways to relax uh, mm. to let off the steam i think there's probably healthier ways to relax than a drink but I think for, for a for a camaraderie creation, when yes. you're all in it together, it's uh it's it, it it helped us a little bit because we were all relatively new together as a team. Right. When I'd come in, uh, you know, an awful lot of my colleagues had either joined at roughly the same time as me or were I'd brought them into the organization. So, you know, we didn't have a lot of time to sort of get to know each other. So some of those things helped, just that regularity and sharing and, and things like that and humor. Humor. Yeah, humor's come up a lot in, in these conversations. Mm. It seems very important. As you say, it's like a release, isn't it? So it's, a, it's yes. a release valve. Mm. So what would you say has been the worst pressure you've ever been under? I think when we were taking 
steps to save Debenhams and it became clear that we wouldn't be able to do that in the way that we'd hoped and that we had to go to a plan B and the plan B was quite dress drastic for for many stakeholders um, and you just have this huge sense of responsibility that you can't control the outcome because it, it required other people to do things and that hasn't been done and therefore other people get very negatively impacted by that um and i think i'd never done it before so in a way mm. I, if i'd done it before i might have either felt less pressure because you know it's not the end of the world it's just a different phase of the world um or was there some ignorance is bliss <laughs> that maybe I wasn't didn't feel all the pressure because I wasn't aware quite how serious it could be and how Im impactful you know I had some of it but not all of it so um I think that's that's one I mean I do I do recall some of the dark days and they were dark because it was January February anyway right so it was, all of these things happen in winter and make it worse somehow yeah. the light sky at night in the evening and the birds singing all make things better for me so yeah. in the darker days you know you just this was when I was really having to do the mindfulness calm app every night mm -hmm. and I'd wake up and I couldn't get things off my mind so I had to learn how to take things thoughts recurring thoughts that you only ever get at like two or three in the morning it's very irritating mm -hmm. now, how do you take them out of your mind because sleep is so important mm -hmm. and you just can't go back in the next day if you haven't had enough sleep and 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 be able to you know perform well and and and, and help everybody so um the, the the sort of the dark days leading up to that I think were the most pressure and you just felt I need to just get through this it yes. will pass. It will pass yes. because the deadline will 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 get to the deadline. But that I think that was the yeah the most difficult. And did you did you find a way that helped you take those thoughts out of your head at two or three in the morning? I did. I'm not. Yes, I did. I don't, I'm not entirely sure that I'm the most successful proponent of this particular technique. But someone was saying to me, and I think it is part of mindfulness. And I wouldn't profess to know enough about that to to talk about it in in much depth but the idea that thoughts are well someone said to me thoughts are like trains and you're standing at the station and you watch these trains come in and you let them go and and that's your thought so you're separating yourself from your thought that didn't work for me I tried that I turned mine into a river and my thoughts were in my head and I was taking them out of my head and I was placing them on a little boat and the boat was going down the river out of sight and that works for me Wow, Rachel, that's really helpful. Mm. I yeah. think because you haven't lost them, you put them in the boat, so they still exist. So you don't yes. need to worry that you've lost whatever that thought in case there was any value in it, rather than just irritation. Um, but but for me, that 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 works. That you're taking it out and you're putting it somewhere and it's going away. Was right. I still use it? Great. I, I once worked with a with a woman who had a, a strategy that worked for her, which was. Before she went into her bedroom, she would put all of the thoughts that were on her mind that she felt would interrupt the quality of her sleep in this bag, in this metaphorical bag, mm. um, which she would then leave outside the door. And there was a very important place where she needed to leave it, which was you know outside rather than anywhere close to the door. Mm. And then she would go sleep. And then when she came out, she'd pick them up. She'd literally mm. metaphorically pick the bag up. And that, in a similar way that you've just described, was really helpful for her. Mm. Um, and what I love about this stuff is that it doesn't matter what it is, as long as it works. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And it's interesting. I, I like that one. She's put yes. what in yes. the, into the bag, the things, the thoughts that she wants to pick up in the morning. She yes. probably didn't put the other rubbishy thoughts in there that she wanted to get rid of. <laughs> no, no. Maybe she needed two bags as a whole. Yes. The rubbish bag on. and the keep yeah. bag. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. exactly. OK, great. Where are you now with your relationship with pressure and the choices that you've got ahead of you? Rachel? Yeah, I would like now to have pressure that is healthy. I felt that four and a half years of, of what I've just gone through, mm -hmm. large chunks of that were not healthy for me. Hence the, the 
just dis the decision to do all of the change in my exercise regime and the mm. walking and and the eating fasting type thing um and i don't want to go back to a place that that feels that that stressful there's a difference between pressure and stress yeah. and you know it's all self created right the pressures don't exist other than that w what you make of them for yourself um but I want to make choices now that doesn't lead me down those paths again. Um, but at the same time, I'd like to be able to give something back. So be able to advise and help people who are in those circumstances, because once you're in them, you, you, you generally, well, I don't, I'm not the kind of person that would say I'm quitting and I'm off, mm. you know, you're in them and you have to see them through. Um, and so I am sure in the current, cost of living crisis there are many people that are in that so whilst I don't want to personally go back in and lead any of that I know that there will be people who either do want to or just by without choice are in that you know and it would be good to sort of help people and if anyway be someone listening to this blog exactly gets an idea about the boats in the river or or yeah. the sports massage or you know ways for them that they could explore that helps them relax and get their energy um but also you know in 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 difficult circumstances in a business you do have to be decisive and sometimes those decisions have to be made really quickly yeah. um and so just helping anyone that that's in those circumstances that as you said it's just having someone else to talk to to say yeah. look i think this is right but is it yeah am i thinking so, about it right i think it's interesting this deci decisiveness because many people struggle with being decisive i think i'd struggle with being decisive so for me to talk to someone like you, who naturally is decisive, could you undo that a bit for us? Because there must be other people like me listening to this. <laughs> I'd like to be more decisive. But sometimes in moments of uncertainty, it's hard to back yourself with the decision that you want to make. Yeah. So how do, how do you do fast decisions, Rachel, in moments of crisis? I get, I was going to say as many facts, I don't get as many facts as I could because you've got to do 80, 20 on this stuff. So that's one of the things actually that I do. I think I've got to get 20% of the facts will get me 80% of the value, but I don't, I don't just say I only want 20% of the facts, but I do want to understand as much as I can about the situation and the alternatives. What are the options? Right. And then. So how do you do that? Let's just stop there. How do you yeah. do that? Um. Do you have a place where you go? I mean, do you where do you do that thinking and how do you find it? I mean, what's your what's your routine? What's your sort of you mm. must have a way of thinking, right, I need to find as much as I can that enables me to make a decision. What do you do? I would I, with myself first, I brainstorm what I think the options are. OK. Um, and often there's a do, don't do, and then there's variations on those of do A or B or C or don't do A or B or C. Um, and then I talk to people because everyone t typically has, a, 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 you know, a different way of seeing the world. And I always think two heads are better than one. I always do. I always have for, for something that, that you know, to, to to come up with a creative solution, I think sharing that, and getting other people's perspectives. I, and, and when I was in a CFO role, I would often lead with what I thought the options were. But I think as I've been in a chief exec role, I often don't, I often wait because I don't want to be the one that says this is the answer and therefore nobody else speaks up. So now what I do is I say, look, these, this is the situation. What do people think and get perspectives? And then you know, if everybody disagrees with what I thought, then I'm thinking, ah, oh, I've clearly missed something here. Um, mm. But I think at that then I I don't like to leave a meeting unless we're consciously not making a decision without having made a decision. So there's some discipline to it as well, which is what's the purpose of this meeting? Was the purpose of this meeting to assess everything and make a decision? If it was, that's what we're doing. Right. Not, oh, we'll write something down and we'll think about it and we'll come back. But right. it 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 depends because, you know, you could say in this meeting, all we're doing is having a discussion. And in which case, then no one's stressed to come to a, a decision too quickly. And sometimes you just think, and it's intuitive, I, I don't have enough information. Or, right. no, no, I have enough. Right. 
And that's an intuitive, in, that's an instinct for you, is it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. But, but built over many, many years, you know, it, intuition yes. to me is just oh. really fast connections of all your experience put together. So agree with you. Hmm. Interesting. It doesn't come from and, outer space, right? It, it it's, no. it's collected there and you get, you know, I'm, I, you, that's not to say someone who isn't sort of 18 can't be intuitive. Of course they can. But I think intuition comes from a base in knowing things yeah, and being able to assimilate them possibly unconsciously, which is why it feels like it's come from somewhere that wasn't yeah. thought through, if you see what I mean. Yes. And and so so there's two stages is you're on your you're on your own working on right the sort of 2080 or what 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 do I think the the do this, don't do this type brainstorm. Mm. Then there's the connection with others. Yes. To test, I'm hearing, or to certain or to find out and or surface on, surface other ideas and surface. thoughts and options. Yeah. Or... And are they always with people within the organization, Rachel? Or do you go out do you do you test that with other people? Um, well, when you're in a in a situation of of business crisis, you can't go outside the organisation unless it's to advisors. So, of course, in in that instance, it would be your executive colleagues, your board, yeah. and your advisors. So it's a trust, a, a circle of trust, yeah. commercial trust, right? If it was something else that weren't, you know, confidential in its nature, then yes, because actually, one thing that I have learned through the crisis is that advisors are worth their weight in gold if you get good ones yeah and um and therefore having that that network of people that you can trust and rely on and just say look I'm just what do you think mm. um but in business it's difficult because you know many so, so many things are deeply confidential that you yeah you know you can't yes. um but um you know, it's, it's like in, in your personal life you a lot of it goes in on, on in your own head but you need to check in with your friends to make sure you're not lost the plot <laughs> yes you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> checking with reality yeah so you've done the thinking on your own you've taken it to your team and maybe your board and maybe your advisors and then what do you do well if we haven't made the decision by then i make it because or, or it's not important to make a decision and therefore it's fine we carry on not making a decision um okay, so but you usually you decide, in those not to decide yeah yes yeah okay why do you think we find some of us find that difficult? <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, well, what do you what do you find? Why why do you not? Ah, make I that's such a great question. I think I can ruminate for just too long on something. I think that's my issue is that I can just find myself still going through this sort of loop um, of and and feeling. I suppose you know I have far too many perfectionists. Uh, <laughs> tendencies Rachel right. which you know with that just holds everything up sometimes you know um and I yeah. and I recognize it in others but I certainly recognize it in myself and so listening to you is very helpful for me because there is a real clarity in what you're saying right you know this is that's what you do it's like mm. it's you have to get com competence yes you have to get comfortable with knowing when 80 20 is absolutely is the right enough level yeah, yeah and sometimes when it isn't and you do have to go to that more, yeah not perfect but but more information because the risk is too large if you don't if you see what I mean so yeah um yeah I mean I think the other thing is when when we were doing some of this management um team building sessions one of the one of the people facilitating us we were talking about a specific issue and we kept on going around it and I was getting, angry, but I was in my listening phase. So I wasn't making a decision. <laughs> and he just said, you as a team are awfully good at admiring the problem. And I thought that was a really good way of nailing it. Some people like going over and over and over and over it. And they love that bit. They love admiring the problem rather than getting rid of the problem. And I thought that and, and every time we were trying to drift towards an answer, someone else would bring up another articulation of the problem. And he just said, like, that's what you're doing. So, mm. um, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Are people is that? Yes. Just thinking yeah. through over analyzing or just just frankly indulging yourself in the problem is what he was saying. Yeah. It's quite interesting. The problem. Love that. Yes. 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 And um, a, another phrase that I really like is that limiting um arguing for your limitations 
ah, I've not heard that one. Which is in a similar guise. Yes. Like yes. Where are you spending your energy? You're admiring the problem and you're also arguing for your limitations. <laughs> you think like, right, let's just stop doing that and let's move <laughs> that forward. <laughs> this is such a useful provocation from Rachel. Knowing when and how to decide. When to stop admiring the problem, stop overanalyzing. Under pressure or in high challenge situations, the tussle between our gut instinct, our intuition, and making a considered choice is very much alive. It's acute, in fact. Making a decision gives us a sense of control, and the science tells us that feeling in control is a biological imperative. So how do we listen to our intuition in moments of pressure and make a considered choice? Chief Fire Officer Sabrina Cohen-Hatton came up with a model called intuition-led decision-making. It recognises both the analytical and the intuitive. She realised that in emergency situations, firefighters would naturally make decisions based on a mixture of previous experience and their coping strategies. In the face of extreme danger, Cohen Hatton knew she couldn't stop that, but realised that the moment to force the pause was in those seconds between making the decision and implementing it. She introduced a rapid mental check called a decision control that all trainees are now drilled in. It's a framework for their thought process to raise their situational awareness. What's important is that they are drilled in it outside the pressure so it can kick in quickly when they are under pressure. They're trained to ask themselves three things. One, why am I doing this? What's my goal now? Two, if I follow my intuition, what might happen? Three, how well do the benefits outweigh the risks? Now, while most of our decision-making is not about saving lives, having a framework like this or like Rachel's can help in making decisions under pressure. There are two questions, as you know, I always ask at the end of the podcast, which is, you know, if you had to offer or pay forward two things to anyone listening to this podcast who would like to be better under pressure, what would be your two offers to pay forward? I think they come from a place of, of my own experience, um, which is that if you are in difficult circumstances for, a, for a, a lengthy space of time, then absolutely find what gives you your energy. Whether you're an extrovert, an introvert, a bit like me, I'm a bit of both. What really can you do in either your every day or at least once a week that really helps build up your tanks again of, of, of energy. So that'd be the first one. And differently to it, but maybe connected, but learn how to bring down your level of activity. You know, physiologically, you've got adrenaline and cortisol and they are bad for you in lengthy doses um, because they uh, give you high blood pressure, they speed up your heart, um, they do all sorts of other horrible things to, to you know, that means can lead you to an imbalance of things going on in your body and your mind. Um, so find ways of genuinely relaxing and getting rid of unhelpful thoughts and listen to your body. If that's tension like me, get a deep tissue massage or something. Mm. If it's mindfulness that helps getting rid of issues on a boat down the river, whatever, find those things for you and do those every day when you're at that if you're starting to feel that you you know you're trapped yeah that to me is a sign that it's gone on too long for you therefore you yes. need to start taking action yes and just on that rachel what are your first signs that that's happening to you a bit of panic and where do you feel panic chest a bit of I can't do this. Yeah. I want to get out of this. I don't know how to get out of this. Yeah. Um, and therefore you're in negative thoughts rather than, yes, I can do this and I've got people around me that can do this and we're gonna do it. You don't yeah. you don't you don't spiral into those. You spiral into the ones that everything everything can't be done. Yeah. What what I remember actually it's the first time you've mentioned it in this podcast, but I if I had to put a word that I you've used with me when we've when we've been together, that word trapped is a real sign for you. Mm. Yes, it is. Yeah. And it feels like it's a physical feeling of being trapped, which is a tightness in the chest, but also yes. a mental feeling of, yes, what's my way out? Yes, <laughs> exactly. This? Yes. 
<laughs> and so I can absolutely imagine why nature for you is a complete release of that because oh yeah yeah I mean I we went up to Norfolk um last weekend and the, I've never been to the to the wash area it's just flat 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 the sky is at its most huge right because there's no hills in the way and we just saw these birds the, you know the murmurations well they're not called murmurations if they're not starlings it's called something else anyway that you know, where you just see this cloud of birds and swirling and moving. It was so extraordinary. So find find your equivalent of what that is, because it is. It's you, you're in an endless space. Yes. And then you can. I was talking to David Shelley, the CEO of Hachette last week, and he was saying he had a similar moment up on the top of a mountain that he remembers getting real clarity at the top of that mountain. And everything seemed to sort of feel possible. And yes. and. And that was years ago for him, but he can still pull forward that moment in yes. his mind. He said, I can feel it. I can sense it. I can smell it. I can see it. And I think what, what you're saying is something very similar is that you'll, that'll never leave you that moment. Yeah. And, and so you can recall it as and when you need it. Mm. Yes. And it takes you back to that feeling. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure there are others, you know, for me, it's visual, but for many people, it's smell, Yes. Or it's or it's hearing a noise, but the smell is very evocative. So as I said, the 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 cut of the cut of green grass, you know, I'm just straight back on that yeah. athletics pitch, aged 15 or whatever it is. Um yeah. but what what is good is to find the really, really positive ones um that, that energize you. Yeah. Brilliant. Rachel, thank you so much. Thank you. Really enjoyable. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Better Under Pressure with me, Sarah Milne Rowe. If you enjoyed it, please do subscribe and let us know what you found useful or what you'd like to know more about. Our aim is to share as many examples as possible of what people do to manage pressure for better. If you're interested in any of the practices mentioned, check out my book, The Shed Method. Alternatively, you can find us at Coaching Impact or me on LinkedIn and Instagram. Better Under Pressure was produced by the fab team at Smart Cookie Media. Thanks so much for listening and until next time, goodbye.